So in this evolution, now as we conceive it from the present moment, this 21st century, the universe began as a perfectly symmetrical but unstable vacuum, a quantum vacuum. It was somehow catalyzed, it was disturbed, and in this, but in this perfect vacuum, all the forces of nature were undifferentiated. It was perfect symmetry, but unstable. Then, with the Big Bang, the expansion of the universe, the cosmos went through several symmetry-breaking phase transitions, which led then to the differentiation or the distinction of forces into gravitational, weak, electromagnetic, and strong forces. And then, of course, particles, antiparticles, and so forth, and eventually big chunks like galaxies. As the universe cooled down following the Big Bang and the inflationary period that followed that, transitioning from the melted vacuum to the current frozen vacuum, the initial symmetry was broken in various ways. So from the perfect symmetry into something that is frozen and imperfect. A lot of brokenness because the world is very chunky and differentiated in, within space. Steven Weinberg, one more Nobel laureate, contemporary, he said, this vision of the world, this current view of cosmology we see around us is only an imperfect reflection of a deeper and more beautiful reality, one of perfect symmetry. We're getting the aftermath after the symmetries are broken. Going from a fluid, a melted vacuum to a frozen vacuum. Back to Buddhism for the last time. This is the great perfection of the Dzogchen tradition, which originated in India about 2,000 years ago, now most prevalently in, in Tibet, Tibetan culture. The physical world in this view, coming out of very, the, I think, think some of the deepest contemplative inquiry, the physical world emerges from an implicate unity of the absolute space of phenomena, the Dhammadhatu, the absolute space not equivalent to Newtonian space, but absolute space out of which relative space-time mass energy subject-object emerge that kind of absolute space, absolute space of phenomena, dhammadhatu, primordial consciousness, beyond any subjective awareness versus objective, pr prior to, more fundamental even than the form realm or the formless realm, primordial consciousness, beyond all conceptual frameworks, and a primal energy, jnana vayu, that is indivisible from both space and consciousness, a primal energy that is more primary than electromagnetic, thermal, gravitational, and so forth, but all these three, this absolute space, this absolute consciousness, absolute energy, one might say, all of these inconceivably undifferentiated in a perfect symmetry. The perfect symmetry of this ultimate reality exists in a fourth time, beyond the, de the demarcations of past, present, and future, in a fourth time. Still. Beyond still. And then what happens? Because clearly we're living in a world of time with a lot of differentiations. Du Jum Lingba, a great Dzogchen or great perfection master from the 19th century, writes, this ground that I just referred to, this is present in the mind streams of all sentient beings. It's not out there someplace. It's not somebody else's, like God's. It's in. It's the very essence of the mind stream of all sentient beings, but it is tightly constricted by dualistic grasping. Enter the observer and the differentiation between the observer and the observed. It is tightly constricted. It's frozen. It's congealed by dualistic grasping, and it is regarded as external, firm, and solid. Hence, the physical world. That is how it's regarded. That's how it appears. This is like water in its natural fluid state, freezing in a cold wind, going from melted water to frozen water. Exactly the same metaphor used in quantum cosmology. It is due to dualistic grasping, enter the observer, that onto dualistic grasping onto subjects and objects, that the ground, which is naturally free, perfectly symmetrical, we might say, becomes frozen into the appearances of things. Is that a meaningful convergence or is it trivial? I hope we can find out. Is it an elegant theory or can it be put to the test? The, the great perfection tradition says, oh, we've been putting that one to the test for more than 2,000 years now. You want to know how? One breaks through, that is the term, tekchut in Tibetan, one breaks through the substrate consciousness, which is, which is still individuated, mine versus yours, one breaks through that, frees the mind from dualistic grasping, including freeing awareness from the constructs of subject and object and even the categories of existence and non-existence, and by so doing, the essential nature of awareness is revealed as pristine awareness, vidya, or primordial consciousness, jnana. It's done contemplatively. This is the primordially pure dimension of consciousness which is neither contaminated 
by mental afflictions like craving and hostility, nor is it improved through spiritual practice. There is nothing to be added or subtracted from it. And it's practice. We need labs. We need a place where people can do this for 10 years and have nothing else on their minds. Just do it. Like a dedicated medical doctor, a musician, an athlete, or a neuroscientist. No athletic fields, no athletics. No neuroscience labs, no neuroscientists. No telescopes, no astronomers. No contemplative facilities, no contemplatives. We have to do it as more than a hobby. But I think by coming, bringing these together, the cutting edge in psychology, of neuroscience, the cutting edge of contemplative inquiry, closely collaborating these, it might be possible to integrate these marvelous, sophisticated, rigorous, illuminating third-person methodologies of modern science with the also illuminating, sophisticated, rigorous methodologies of contemplative traditions such as Buddhism and Buddhism has no monopoly. Bringing those together, integrating, letting them cross-pollinate and illuminate each other, that might actually give rise, finally, after 130 years of delay and postponement, to a true revolution in the mind sciences. I think that might spark it. Nobody's got a monopoly. It's not Buddhists giving it to science. It's not science lording it over everybody else. It's something unprecedented. Science has been around for 400 years, Buddhism around for 2,500. Neither one of them has come up with a, mind, a revolution in the mind sciences that we know about as, as us moderns. But by the collaboration, the integration of these, that might revolutionize both. Not to say we develop a new Buddhism, but we develop a fresh take. See it all afresh for the first time. And all afresh, a new vision of the mind scientifically, as Darwin gave us a new, a fresh vision of life itself. It might begin there. How might it culminate? And now being a futurist, which means extremely thin ice. It might culminate with the close collaboration not only of mind scientists and contemplatives. Bring in the physicists. Bring in Andre Lindt, Stephen Hawking, George Ellis and others. These Roger Penrose. Bring them in. Get them in the same room. Get the physicists meditating. Get the meditators to study physics. Get the neuroscientists to study 20th century physics and not get stuck back there in the 19th century, for heaven's sakes. It's embarrassing. Bring in the physicists. Bring in the biologists. Bring in the contemplatives. And bring about a revolution. Maybe round off the revolution that is not finished. Going back to Max Planck and Einstein. It's not finished. Maybe it can only be finished if we finally understand the nature of the observer which they keep on pointing to again and again and again. The observer, observer participancy. What is the nature of the observer? You have to understand the mind. You have to understand the consciousness in order to understand the observer. But the physicists have no tools for understanding the mind. That's why they're physicists. Let them collaborate closely. Let them actually meditate. Let the meditators study these other fields so they can speak the same language. Physicists, biologists, contemplatives, bring about the culmination in this current revolution in physics, which is ongoing, and perhaps a further revolution in biology, and then just plumb the depths of the revolution in the mind sciences. Wouldn't that be thrilling and unprecedented? So, just a possibility. <laughs> but the possibility becomes an actuality when we start making measurements. Any questions or comments, observations? I'm finished.